Hello, hello. Check, check. Check, check. Check, check. Yeah, that's not bad. Welcome, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am North Park Map, where that thing was. I'm Lee Savar from Mapa Forward. I'm the host of the Daily Mapa Forward by Mapa Forward. It's a pleasure for me to host this panel. Um, but today we are talking about, I'm going to read the top of thing, Innovation, Tech and the Future of Specialty Coffee. And I chose these amazing people to be on this panel because of their experience in the industry, as well as their visionary thinking. These are some of the smartest people that I know in coffee. And the way that they can think about seeing the future of coffee really inspires me in the way that I look at technology and the way that I want to implement technology into the coffee industry. For those who listen to the podcast, you know that we are very pro-technology and progress. And so these three wonderful here have all been on the podcast and uh, we're going to kind of deep dive into the way that they are going to see technology and innovation in this panel. Uh, to introduce them, we have Cosimo Lobato. We, it's a pleasure, sir. We have Sara Moroki and we have Noah Abra. I'm going to let them tell you a little bit about what they do before we deep dive into this conversation. So, um, I do many things, uh, but uh, the main ones are I work for a company called Cheado, uh, makes grinders and brewers as of late. And I'm also part of the board of the Specialty Coffee Association as the treasurer. Simon? I, made, I, I founded Boon Origin Consulting. We are a green coffee relief consulting company and uh, also a coffee education digital platform for coffee exporters, cooperatives to uh, sell more coffee at better prices. The long story or the short story? Uh, I'm, I'm from Sydney. I run my own coffee company called Stitch Coffee, but also we run a co-roasting space. We manufacture drip bag and steep bag for most of specialty coffee in Australia. And um, I do have my own retail service. So where we kind of want to look at this is from the entire scope of the supply chain. So I want to start with you, Noah, at the consuming end of the supply chain. And what's important to you from, I know Noah's brand very, very well. And the reason that I call Noah's brand Stitch Coffee the best coffee roasted grains in the world is because of the way that his mind approaches technology and innovation on a multi-level level perspective. So Noah, how do you see that technology and innovation is going to help the B to C uh, industry, if you want to call that, in the future? I think I think technology um, since the introduction of some automatic coffee machines or automation of the milk frothing or the queen spins has really evolved us as baristas or us how we do the coffee and how do we interact with consumers who come to our cafes. It's really opened up an opportunity for us to focus on giving them an amazing experience. And by giving them amazing experience, we were able to get them to buy more coffee to take home and to enable them to... Um, have an opportunity to at least not just be told what to do, but also have a conversation and, and try to understand what needs to be done to get a better coffee at home. And, and we should have had a conversation before we came up here, but we were doing stuff. Let's just have a conversation. Anyone wants to talk about something that anybody else is talking about, feel free to, to do that. And folks, if you've got any questions for anyone up here while we're having a discussion, jump in. Let's do this like it's a group podcast. <laughs> What do you think are the things that are going to change the life from that perspective? Like as we look at, you and I are best mates with uh, ChatGPT. So how are those kinds of things? I, I don't need to look that up. You liar. No, no, sure, yeah. <laughs> I may as well be married to ChatGPT. Um, how, how do you think that uh, technology and innovation is going to impact in 10 years? I, th I think it's not about uh, what, what's really going to impact is is the way we will be uh, perceiving coffee moving forward. I think the concept, how do we 
accept coffee making at home. It's, it's really changing and what we're realizing now, there is a lot more open-minded in terms of cafe owners where they are accepting new technology where specialty coffee didn't accept it in the past and, and one of the main reasons is because shortage in vapor uh, also is really having a big impact. Like before you can tell, uh, you know, let, let's talk about turf bags or, or steam bags, right. I guess. This is the technology that's been around in Japan for almost 10 years or probably more. And uh, we brought it into Australia. We were the second, like one of the first two roasters that actually start doing it. We started by hand and then we bought the machine and then we bought another machine. Um, I think, you know, those type of technology are really kind of change people's perception about filter coffee. You know, like when you get a drip bag, you can, you can do it versus the origami or V60 and you're still going to get a decent cup of coffee. Like it's not, it's not bad if you follow certain proteins, you know. So, so I think those type of innovation are really going to change how people perceive coffee moving forward. And Cosimo, you help people build business. And what impact do you think that technology and innovation is going to have in that kind of thing? Well, I think, you know, the biggest problem specialty had was the making the result reproductible and scalable. Specialty for the longest time was easy to scale up. So consistency of flavor, I think we operate in the business of flavor. Coffee is part of it. And a lot of specialty brands have had the problem to... Uh, maintain the quality that we're trying to achieve in the end coming to the consumer as a way to engage them with the consumer and be different from the commercial coffee just to generalize well that's been a problem for the longest time so if technology is allowing finally to make flavor reproductible and consistent that happens in real that happens in coffee that helps helps the workflow in terms of getting it out I feel like we've got this super automatic discussion about to happen. No, oh, no. <laughs> it's not. It's about automation in general. Like if you take, there are a lot, you know, the innovation presented just in milk froth, baby. Yeah. With things that go next to an espresso, oh, sorry, a traditional, the microphone is not easy to position. Uh, with things that go next to an espresso machine for milk frothing. But now, there was none of those were existing a few years ago. Now you've got easily six, seven manufacturers of different tools that are supposed to automatically cut milk with the baristas doing other things. Uh, the tampers, automatic tampers, but you got now grinders that talk with espresso machines in terms of managing the flow of water and adjusting the grind automatically. So it, I think, you know, with technology, Two things come. One is the curse of technology, seen as a bad the curse. Because the romance goes away, you don't feel like you're doing your job. Is anyone else a fan of the romance? <laughs> I am a fan of the romance, but on the other end, if the romance means your cup doesn't taste the same, then you charge the same amount of money to the consumer for something that's not Very. that bad. <laughs> I mean, I think there is a problem with that. Yeah. What, if you uh, adapt the price of what you sell to the quality of what you sell, then you could say, yeah, uh, it's fair. I do think consumers want to have a, a flavor experience. They're looking at having the best experience they can in a cafe. Whatever helps that is welcome. On the other end, technology is the way to do it, but then takes away things that we weren't doing ourselves maybe not always consistently but we like to it a lot and right now that's where the dilemma is for a lot of people you know the interesting part about technology when it comes to the consumer for me is the way that it's shifting consumer behavior so here in dubai nobody goes to the supermarket anymore people buy everything on apps people buy, get all their food delivered this is a shift in technology that has really impacted the fact that a lot of cafes are empty but they're still very busy. We've got people in the, in the audience here that can attest to that. Um, how do you think, do you think that that's a healthy thing for the cafe environment or do you think that that's something that's going to hurt it long term? It, you know, they talk about the digital world now. The digital... Digital? Digital. What's physical digital? and digital continuum. So when you design a business, you don't have to think of your business anymore just as a physical space. 
you have to think of the extended it digitally into the home. Right. So in a way, it allows you to get into the intimacy of the homes of customers. It's an opportunity, but yeah. it's also a threat. Yeah. It depends on how you play it. Definitely, the pandemic has accelerated a lot of these trends that were in place already. And because of the barriers of moving around and going to see people, people coming into your cafe during the pandemic, a lot of this technology has developed in creating a link also at home with your consumers or customers. Home delivery has been growing. Subscriptions have been growing. So you maybe don't consider, you don't deliver what they call the wet coffee or dry coffee. You know, the, in Australia there was this terminology, wet coffee is anything in a cup that is liquid. Dry coffee is the beans or ground coffee. So you can deliver to your customers at home either drinks, and some companies have started to do it in China without mentioning names. <laughs> um, and, but there are also subscriptions. Subscriptions have been growing a lot because people at home have been drinking better coffee. Uh, with the pandemic, it was an act of self-care. And so the, the quality of coffee and average that people drink globally has been going up. There's sort of been a massification of specialty. And the response to that has been extending the, the ones that have played the played better, were good at extending the, the physical, the limits of their physical space with the digital space. So that's why it's called digital. It's I think it means it's like t-shirt. A digital space. Digital. <laughs> Sara, um, coffee is an immensely complex agricultural product and there could be a lot of opportunity for innovation and technology to influence the complexity of that. You working at Origin, what role do you see that technology and innovation is going to play at Origin? I mean, th there has been digitalization at Origin before the pandemic. Um, a lot of people feel that at Origin it's all, you know, boots in the farm and Excel sheets. There is a large component of that, but it's uh, not only mm -hmm. that, um, I think that with the pandemic um, there has been acceleration um, and even the producer groups and cooperatives that have been resistant to um, use uh, digital means and channels or, or tools, digital tools to, uh, to structure their business have, have, have started to change. And now I think that the biggest acceleration will come with the new regulations on EUDR. If you're not familiar, that's the European Union De Deforestation Regulations, which is, adds a whole new level of compliance. And we're expecting that while um, the EU was the first to launch, I think other blocks, other countries will follow suit. It's not a perfect uh, regulation, but it's going to stay. So what happens is that before it was just digitalization was to see how can I improve my business, make it more efficient. Now it's, I need to be able to comply in order to even be in the market. So I think this is gonna shift. Um, so that's one thing. I think that the risk at origin is that there are so many companies that are gonna sell you a different digital tool for something very specific. So you have the guys that say, oh, use my cupping app. And then somebody else says, oh, use my farm management system. Blockchain. Or blockchain. Or, hey, use my my uh, tool for uh, carbon insetting, right? That's the newest one. And then use another one to sell your coffee. And use another. And I think that that is creating a lot of noise. Um, it's also uh, not helping producers understand the, the tools that are needed, the ones that are a must have, and the ones that are good to have, or would, it would be nice to have. I think that's the one thing. In an ideal world, you would uh, have a tool that allows you to do multiple things at the same time. It helps you to track your yield rates. It helps you to track your differentials, your price fixing. It also helps you to manage your inventory and helps you do your financing and your compliance. There are certain companies or to, um, yeah, the tech companies that can provide that. Um, but a lot of the times, 
there is a need for a certain level of customization. Every time have you heard, oh, but here in Honduras is different from Colombia, <laughs> and here is different from Brazil, and then don't get me started in Ethiopia. So the challenge <laughs> is a, a certain level of standardization with a, le- with a layer of customization that adapts to the business model, because the business models are very different. Another myth that I think I personally was able to sort of destroy, and I'm happy that I didn't believe in it, is that internet accessibility, um, being online at origin is, is impossible. When I launched my um, uh, coffee school, uh, from the get-go I was saying it has to be digital, fully online, on demand, no Zoom calls. It's, if we're doing digital education, we're going to use the best practices from tech, you know, not try to mask get us digital when it's really just Zoom calls, right? That's not a technology. Um, and a lot of people told me, you're crazy. Nobody has internet at origin. And to a certain extent, yeah, maybe some farmers up in the hills don't have um, a great connection, but we work with uh, private exporters, we work with mills, we work with cooperatives. If you don't have internet, you're not in business, so I might as well not work with you, right? Um, so we built a, a tool that, uh, the, the way I explain it to people is like, look, if you can watch Facebook and YouTube videos, you can stream my school. A lot of people said you're crazy, nobody's gonna do it. And you always have this fine balance between being ahead of the curve, but not sound like you're completely in outer space. And so I feel, I felt that in 2019, 2020 with COVID, that, that was the boost that you needed. And I think whoever took advantage of that moment, um, you are ahead of the curve enough without, if I started it 10 years ago, I would probably be losing money. You know what I mean? So I, I think that's, that's the thing, the myth is, uh, people at Origin need digital solutions. Um, there are the infrastructures in place to do it. I think you need to come with a product that solves multiple needs. Um, so don't just get caught up in building the best cupping app that there is in the market if your cupping app doesn't link in inventory. You know what I mean? So try not to build a Ferrari on its own because I feel that producer organizations need multiple things on the technology to run their business. And if you do it all at once, you're going to be better off than if you just specialize in something. At least once a week, somebody contacts me and says, hey, I've got this amazing ad. I want to come on your podcast and talk about it. Yeah. And the first question I ask them is about data integrity. And they look at me like, what do you mean data integrity? And my question to them is, well, how are you going to maintain the integrity of the data that you're going to put in your app? And then they get confused by that kind of question. And what I wonder is how open are, because the gap is, how willing are producers going to be to provide the information and update the apps and put information on the blockchain as regularly as is necessary to maintain data integrity. Mm-hmm. How open are producers to doing that, do you think, as technology uh, evolves? Unfortunately, producers are very used to give away all their information. I don't think expect to do that. So, only now I think that they're starting to realize we have been giving away everything for free for so long. How many times have we heard people come on stage and talk about the business model? I visited this cooperative, I went through their books and I analyzed their costs, their face costs, their brand. I can tell them they're you know profitable or it's a mess and so forth. Right? Like completely, you know, opening up books to random, sorry to say, white people yep. coming there and do it. So I don't think it's about data integrity. I think at the end of the day producers and private exporters or cooperatives have one mission and one mission only. Sell more coffee at better prices. That's it. If you do this, then you can do the sustainability, then you can do a project, development, but they need the income. So if the technology helps you to get there and solve that number one problem, which is how do I remain profitable, competitive, relevant in the market, um, then I think that they're very open. What they're not open is toys. 
you know, so you know, right? Because that's where they are. Like in my school, yeah, all the time. Oh, you should have an app for that. I don't have an app for my school. It's online, but I don't have an app. You can't download it on the phone, but you can view all my courses on the phone. It's properly structured. It's not funny like this. But a lot of people say, why don't you build an app? Yeah, gamify like, it, right? Yeah, gamify it. Yeah, I was like, why don't you build the app? And I was like, to do a good app that does what I do, I need $100,000. Exactly. Where is that money coming from, right? I need to invest that money and then shove that app down people's throat. Try to build a Ferrari when all I need, I'm sorry I'm going to make my value joke, all I need is a Fiat Panda and I can get there, right? So until I can run with my Panda and people are happy, the moment I'll, I'll stick to that and I'm not going to try to pass that cost down to the producers. The moment my clients or my students say, your platform is not working, I can't stream and it's not working on mobile, then I won't invest in an app. Until then, Three years running, I have not heard it once. Business. I have not heard it once for my clients. I need an app. But everybody's like, oh, you need an app to do this. No, you don't. Customer, so, you look like you've got a whole bunch of opinions about that. No, I'm just uh, thinking of the panda right now. Just so, yeah. This panda is a good guy, especially the old pandas, the 4x4. Four four, so, uh, <laughs> I, uh, exactly. I, uh, uh, yeah, apps are everywhere. I was just thinking about when it was saying that, that yeah, apps are everyone wants an app for something except apps get old too, so they last very little. I think it depends for what you need to do. Definitely technology sometimes gets in the way and what she's doing is right. Producers are the most exposed part of the supply chain. And there is technology that they need, but often they get taken advantage of and it has to do things that are, they're not supposed to do. And yes, I agree with Sarah about the fact that they, they give away everything. Yeah. And that's not, and that's a problem with our industry that sometimes we thought certain things were normal, transparency. Yeah. Uh, let's talk, instead of technology, let's talk about transparency. And transparency has been pushed in ways that is interesting to me. Everyone is transparent now. We all became transparent. Yeah, we're all the same. Right. So. Well, when it comes to that, let's talk about pricing and transparency and technology. Because this is somewhere where I look at something like the sea market, which is a form of technology that hasn't moved at all for a very long time. And as we move into the future, what role do you think that technology is going to play on the pricing of coal? It's to me, it's never. Well, let's look at the at the producer level, right? Like the price of green coffee, the price that we're paying for commercial coffee, whether it's on a, a grander scale with the, the bigger, massive companies, or we're, we're talking direct trade. What role do you think technology is going to play in making pricing fairer for producers? I mean, that would be the, the silver bullet, right? That's what we want. Can we use technology as a way to fast track more fairness for producers and coffee pricing? I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that and then maybe my friends can also step in and help me. So, um, yes, so I, I definitely think that technology should help in understanding not pricing, but they start from the basic, which is cost of productions, right? Fixed cost, variable cost, and then your margin. That's how you build a price, right? If you're in any business, right? That's it. If you're at origin, you have cost of cherries, cost of running your uh, your office, your wet mill, your dry mill, fixed cost, variable cost, and then you want to make a, a you want to make a profit out of it, so you charge your margin, right? Unfortunately, at the, that's one side. Then you have the international market price, which acts the way we know it does, right? So the challenge, I think, is how do you match these two, right? I have my own costs and margins and I have to match it unless I'm like high-end specialty but if you're if you're in the business of 82 83 coffees you're looking at the market price okay that's just the reality how do I match these two how do I make them work right and then you go into okay how you're gonna look at the C market and the technology to price price uh, uh, 
price trends and price behavior and all that. And that's already all available. You, nobody needs to reinvent the wheel there. The problem is that uh, the challenge is that a lot of the people that need to do this basic costing don't really have the information, right? When you say that, sorry to interrupt you, when, they do, when you say they don't have the information, do you mean they don't have the knowledge or the understanding or the actual information access? Of All of the above. Okay. So for example, I'm a cooperative, right? I have an Excel sheet for my cherry buying. Right? right, and I have somebody in charge of buying coffee, and then they know oh, the cherry price is X Y Z. Then you have the sales manager, huh? the contracting prices on the other side, and they look at the C or the fair trade and blah blah. Another Excel file. Then you have the finance guy running cash flow, uh, payroll, and everything. Then it's another Excel sheet. Nothing is on the clouds. How are you going to reconcile the rice? Right. Problem number one. Everybody has his own Excel sheet, and half the time, the guys don't talk to each other, right? So then, at the end of the year, the accountant is, a, it, at the end of the year, you want to find... Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the year, you find out if you make money or lost money. No, I say the Excel sheet of the accountant is not going to be happy about the other <laughs> ones not marriage. Yeah. Usually that's what happens. Yeah. I mean, and that, and that happens across the supply chain. It happens at the cafe oh. level. And, and, you know, this is what is quite the challenge. The barrier to entry into our industry is so low across the entire supply chain. And because of that, there's this success fallacy that because there's so many cafes, and there's so many coffee farms, and there's so many groceries, it must be a successful, profitable business and all that. And so people enter not having the knowledge of how to do these fundamental accounting practices or any kind of business structures at all. And this is where what you're saying, Sada, is it, it's the, the manifestation of the problem yeah. down the track, right? Yeah. Go ahead. I, I think on the point you were making before, technology helping hardware producers. Well, I think technology per se doesn't help or doesn't add or take away anything, but I do think that one of the things the producers, and basically to to repeat what Sarah was saying in a different way, what they need is knowledge, is empowerment, because they are the part of the industry that has the least access to the least. They don't have to give everything away, but they have a, in return, they don't get any information about where is, like, I have Personally, I took a course with Mario Fernandez of Wenda uh, on uh, cube processing, generous level. He says the biggest mistakes that roasters make is they go to farmers and they tell him, they tell them you should do this process because your coffee is going to sell more or you're going to sell it for more. The reality is that often these people then the year after come back and they're not happy with the result of the process and they don't buy the coffee. Often and, and that conversation with the farmer is often managed by the roaster or the exporter. But in reality, farmers sometimes do things because of limits they have, the land that they have, the access to water, the amount of money they have. Those are all factors that influence what they can do. And sometimes it, our industry, the specialty coffee, tends to have fashions that are popular in a certain moment. So we're telling them, why don't we all produce honey process? Why don't we all produce uh, these fermented coffees? Is that the right thing to do for everyone? Is it possible that all farmers all of a sudden are producing these fermented coffees? I don't, I don't think it's, it's normal to ask that of farmers. So what technology is doing now, and this is something, now talk about the SCA, sorry. No, don't be sorry. So with want. the CBA system, what we're trying to do is we separated the evaluation of coffee. First of all, we eliminated score as a way to drink coffee because score, as you said, you mentioned it implicitly, for the lower scoring coffees, they're nobody's child, you know. They're specialty, but not specialty enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what our industry does. So those coffees tend to be left behind. Although the UF markets, they don't get to pay the fair price, price they could be receiving. So, 
score in, in its way only praises the high score in coffees, not the lower score in specialty coffees. Plus, consumers really don't create a relationship. How do they know it's 87 and 89? What is the difference worth? Third, there is a subjective part of, of cafe coffee that is there that we don't admit is there, but like and dislike can make us score up or down a coffee. And that's personal like. There's nothing to do with what is in the coffee. So what we created was this form, this new method called coffee value assessment system that is made of three forms. One is descriptive. You describe what's in the coffee by using coded references that define flavors that are linked to the flavor wheel. The UC Davis, University of California, UC Davis has the samples. It's a bit like the meter that is in Paris. You have the sample in Paris and then there are thousands, hundreds of millions of meters out there that are used every day to measure stuff. Well, that sample is the code that defines brown sugar. So if you taste brown sugar, you should refer to that. It's all coded, so you don't write everything you want there. But normally, those are the compounds that are present in coffee that are listed, and the mix of them will determine the flavor present. So that's one form, descriptive. The other one is called affective. How much I like a certain flavor in coffee, or how much I dislike. I score it down there. But that's personal like, it's not based on if the coffee is good or not. And then at the end there is the extrinsic form, which describes things like the name of the farm, or where it comes from. Obviously if a coffee is called Geisha, no matter where it comes from, a Geisha will always get more money than a Pacamada. On average. Just because it's called Geisha. Right? That's extrinsic. That doesn't depend on the coffee, the farmer, or if I like it or don't dislike it. Geisha sells more or the name of a certain farm, or a, if it's Panama Geisha, you do more than a Geisha from Taiwan. That comes with the extrinsic attributes of that coffee, right? So we have to recognize the values determined by all these factors. What the SEA is doing, and now we come to the technology, is linking the codes that are associated with flavor uh, to a way to process that data that when you use this form get collected by country. So what's happening, we're hopefully everyone is going to start adopting this form because the more companies adopt this form, the more data will be available to farmers to know which is the country that will pay more for their coffee. Because that's real empowerment. So what we're, what we're trying to do is bring back to the farmer the knowledge because each coffee is a market, or a better market, because what score, what is not like for even defective coffees like phenolic, for Turkish coffee, they are actually welcome. So farmers that have a defect of curry in their harvest, they could find the market for their coffee. Then price is more. So technology helps in processing big data and communicating consumer preferences to the farmers. I want to make this a little more spicy now. Okay. Sada, what role do you think the evaluation form is going to have for producers? When we look at saying that we're going to collect all this data, and just to clarify, she doesn't know that I'm getting this question. Cosimo, I don't know what she's going to answer to this, so don't think that... that this is she's entitled to think like what she wants. <laughs> but, what, if we're looking at saying that the SCA is collect, collecting this data so that they can then go and process this for producers and make this better for producers. What are your thoughts on how much impact that's actually going to have for producers? Well, first of all, I mean, it sounds like it's, it's out in the open, so I would say consent is the first thing, right? So make sure that well, as you start using the tools, you actually ask for consent to opt out if you do not want to have your data to be shared. That's just, you know, making sure that we are complying with basic uh, data privacy. Um, it could be an interesting perspective because at the end of the day, we, I agree with, with Cosimo that there is a copy for every market and it's just a matter of knowing where to put your coffee in the best market to make the best buck out of your coffees. 
if what they're saying is that truly in the end we're getting a map where we're seeing where the best profiles um, are consumed, I, I could see that. If it's linked to the pricing and to better access to market strategies, then that's okay. Okay. Because I, I, I can see value with that. If I know that I cup these coffees, but then I also know that for my profile, these are the, um, the geographies where this coffee could be best positioned, why not? Right. Why not? If, if that information is really there, because I do think that unfortunately, when it came to specialty, it was very US driven, it was very um, EU driven. Right now we're getting more markets where we're getting China, we get Southeast Asia, and 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 others, you know, Middle East. I just think don't a lot of people don't know what these markets are about. So if you're able to help them make strategic decisions on access to market, I'm 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 down for it. I don't I don't see. Now, is it gonna make it really complicated? How easy it is to use the tool? Is it just going to? Do you need a PhD to to use it? then forget it, people are not going to do it. But that's an adoption issue that they're going to have. I, I have not set into a single lecture where it was presented. I've not done it myself, so I'm completely ignorant in what it is. But I, I would say that the biggest uh, challenge would be adoption and integration. And right? trust, I guess, right? And trust, yes. Adoption, integration, and trust. Adoption, because if I'm already I've invested in, uh, in, 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 a, in a capping lab, and I trained, and I've already done this, will I adopt a different tool? Can I migrate from what I'm using today to a different tool? So again, those are the two things. And, and how much will it cost? Yeah, of course. But um, you know, in, in terms, of, in terms of, of costs, yes, that's true. Um, you can make it entry level, and then you have more people. And you don't, you're just gonna get the usual suspects, all the fincas in Central America and some you know and, and and some Kenyans and all that, but you don't capture the largest majority of producers. Um, so and that's a challenge that other companies have, right? Yep. So I would I would say, but I'm not fundamentally wrong, I mean I'm not fundamentally oh. engaged with it. If it's access to market strategies, go for it. Noah, how will this coffee evaluation form impact roasters, do you think? I think it's as a, as a tool. I don't, I don't. As a tool and the way it sounds from Cosimo, I, I believe it's actually, it will benefit us also by one, take the number away because 100% nobody can tell the difference between 87 and 88 from the consumer perspective. You know, it all depends on how we how we package it and how we show it to the consumer, how we end up showcasing it. But knowing, you know, what we are actually getting from this specific coffee from, I mean, we already get flavor profile plus the score, you know, so we're getting both ways. So I, I think for us, this also will help us to assess is this the right coffee for the market that we want to go in it or not. Uh, but personally, I mean, my name is Stitch Coffee, so um, our job is not to... All, all coffee for us are welcome, really. It's just how we present it to the audience and how do we talk about it. So, Let me ask you the question this way. If the coffee evaluation form tells you that Australians prefer coffees from Ethiopia and Brazil, are you going to buy Nicaraguan coffees? Yes. Why? Because we like variety and we like to... I mean, coffee, it's, it's all about showcasing the world of what, you know, what, what all these origins can give from a slaver profile. So it doesn't really matter where it's from. I believe it's, it tastes amazing and, and I know people are going to love it. I'm going to buy it and I'm going to sell it. You know, and, I will, uh, and, and I will win people trust accordingly, but it's not like because they said Australian like specific flavors I need to buy just for them. I think it takes away uh, creativity, innovation, it takes away how we brand ourselves, how do we differentiate ourselves, otherwise we're all going to have peanut butter and... and um, Easy tiger. Uh, hold on one more thing. Uh, Value determination, how do you set that price? from a score 
But the, the, the beauty of that form is not really... Wait, sorry, can you tell me what you mean by that? Yeah, so what, what you do is that we don't have a score that is A score for coffee. The coffee changes score depending on the market where it goes. The value of the coffee depends on the, the flavor preferences in the market. That's what we're trying to do is create a connection between the consumer and the farmer. The farmer knows what the market wants. There are now farmers don't know where the coffee could be sold. They don't have access to the information. But how they know it is because all the traders in that market are, this is statistics, we're not trying to provide a black, black or white scenario. We're saying you're more likely to sell your coffee in these markets if your coffee has these attributes because those are the flavor preferences that are coming from all the traders adopting the form in that market. Okay. So it's big data that is telling statistically it tells you statistically both to the, to the roaster, to the whole supply chain, all the way to the farmer, what the, we as an industry have been terrible at getting the link with consumers. We haven't done a great job as an industry in understanding consumers. Really? Yes. I'm shocked. Are you shocked? Really? <laughs> yeah. So what we're trying to do, instead of telling consumers what they should be drinking because otherwise they're not good enough for us, which is what they can do to a certain extent, we are listening to what they are drinking, what flavors are they looking for. And I said, you hollered it. At all. Right. At this point, um, I'm going to just ask before we wrap up, are there any questions for the panel? Okay. <laughs> sorry, guys. You have zero to be sorry about. because oh, There's a question here. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Oh, that said, sorry. How do you see our the wisdom market? And also the Arabicas that are in a, there are a team space in the Bristol's for sure. Can you can get the mic? So, okay. okay, so I am the father from Central America, mm -hmm. from um, Autoras, the Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. So we have very different markets. So we have in Nicaragua very expensive coffees, big beans, high and dog. And then we have Honduras where we have different markets, organic, Air, but we have about a metronome, and we have a uh, base in Aaron uh, Romulus, which is called Yapida, it's called Palinema, and all this sort of thing. And uh, we have up to the two harvests almost one year, and very little coffee. So now we're trying to find out how the market evolves. All this topic is very interesting to me. So I'm thinking, okay, how can we uh, sell our coffee best? Because uh, it is true. Uh, times you cannot really be only a farmer, I think. And you have to put money from your other companies into coffee. And you want to steer coffee and so on. So I am thinking about how do you see that it would like corner that coffee, for instance, in this part of the world, if Middle East. I don't know nothing about Green East. So I want to know information from a Central American farmer and the Thank you. There are more people in the audience that are able to answer that question. Um, but you guys go ahead. Well, I know Sarah is the expert, so I, I have my opinion on that, but you want me to talk about it. So, for specialty coffee, Robusta has always been like, a, I'm from Italy, we drink Robusta, things were bored, so uh, she's from Italy to two Italians on the panel today. Accidentally. Two Italians and two Arabs, there we go. Yeah, so, sorry. Sorry in advance. So sorry, sorry in advance. I'm joking. Um, robusta has been part of our culture, but uh, robusta, robusta in Arabic means really little to me. They're genetically different. They have different attributes. You extract different flavors out of them. But in reality, in how they get cultivated, because robusta has always been grown for quantity at low price. If you grow robusta for quality. Robusta has the same chance to express exceptional flavors as Arabica. And that market has not been existing so far, but now you've got all the cross saves between, you know, the, the, the South Chin, uh, all the different genetic crossing that happening between the two varieties. And I think they, um, there is a lot of potential for Robusta, especially because with climate change and lower altitude, less available altitude, so growing coffee at lower altitude, you can have hybrids 
and you can have Robusta that is specialty. I tasted in a cupping, in, I was in Australia for the, my Q grader course, and the teacher is in a Robusta from Philippines, which I didn't even know it existed. With the, without telling us, it was a Q arabica course, without telling us that it was Robusta, we scored it in 87 using the Arabica form. At the end, we were told it was Robusta. And this is the perfect example of how our preconception of certain things influences. Because if I give you a Robusta without telling you as a Robusta, the specialty Robusta is, I would think some people would be able to tell the difference. Obviously, if I give you something that is very defective, full of defects, not harvested properly, not processed properly, not grown properly, well, definitely you can tell the difference. But the reality is the robustas have their place, absolutely. I think it's welcome and desirable that that happens. Except that it's going to add potentially to the cost of production because robusta requires a lot more water than Arabica. And so as we look at sustainability, we have to be very aware of how this shift is being driven. Sorry to be a part of the panel while I'm moderating the panel, but this is important to understand. Because status point is really, really expensive. We're not paying enough attention to the cost of production at the producer level. We have to look at how fads are driving the way that coffees are purchased. We have to look at how fads are pushing the way that producers are making decisions. If we don't take into account how different decisions at the consuming end are going to impact the cost of production at a fundamental level long term, when we start waxing poetic about Robusta in this industry, and I was recently spent a lot of time in India with regards to, to this, they are cutting down shade so that they can increase the yield of Robusta, which requires the increase in the amount of water that's required to push the Robusta. Guess what India had this year? 20% drop in rain. The pressure that that puts on producers long term is a problem. And so we as an industry need to start paying attention much more to the kind of pressure that we're putting on producers when we make these kinds of statements. Because they're bearing the brunt of our decisions without us having to care whether that leads to them going out of business or not. So, sorry, I just needed to make that point. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, I mean, uh, two points on the Robusta. I mean, Specialty has been so unkind to Robusta. When I joined Specialty back in 2007, I still remember I was at an event show and there was this buyer that wore this t-shirt that says your grandma drinks robusta mm -hmm. right it's supposed to be an insult right and if that is what we used to how we used to treat robusta we decided it was bad we only care about quality and we killed it we absolutely killed it the specialty killed it yeah we created this perception that robusta is is inferior that doesn't have a place in specialty then fast forward except for a few trailblazers like Mario, like others that they, they are... They like are Professor. Right. Professor Mario and, and, and so forth. So not everybody's like that. But, the, you know, in the 2000s, if you're in specialty, you're supposed to hate and, and talk bad about robust And decaf. And decaf. All of it, right? Total snobbery. Yeah, total snobbery. Then comes the time when all of a sudden Arabica hits three dollars, and all of a sudden Robusta is not that bad after all, right? And and then we started to see these mega price swings, and 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 all of a sudden Robusta is like, okay, man, and people started buying Robusta because they couldn't afford Arabica, right? And then of course the, the so I think some of the approaches to Robusta changed that there was more education. And now Robusta has been finally accepted in the, in the kingdom of specialty. Um, and right now, if you're in Robusta, I hope you're fixing your contracts because your prices are pretty good. And so take advantage of that market as it lasts. 